Today is such a special day for us. As believers, Resurrection Sunday is our Independence Day, it's our birthday, it's our anniversary, and it's the Super Bowl all rolled up into one day for us. Amen? For us, Easter is not just a holiday. For us, Easter is a holy day. It's a day in which we rejoice. It's a day in which we revel in the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. And so I want you to know today, if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are free. You have unbelievable freedom in Jesus. Our faith, our families, and yes, even our future are all intricately linked to the fact that the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive. And quite frankly, uh, not only do we celebrate that on Easter Sunday, but we celebrate that every single Sunday of the year. That's why we meet together on the first day of the week. Every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday for us. The resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of our faith. It's the, it's the source of our power, and it is the reason for our confident expectation of the future. To say it simply today, because of Jesus' resurrection, we can have hope. Because of Jesus' resurrection, you can have hope today. I don't know what your background is. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what the struggles that you're going through today. But whatever it is, I want you to know that because of the fact that the tomb is empty, Jesus is alive, you can have hope today. Quite frankly, though, I get it. It's getting more and more difficult to be hopeful, is it not? With the events that are, that are just taking place in South Florida, I find that many people are moving from uh, hope to hopelessness. I get it. The Parkland shooting, that, that affected all of us, did it not? The, the collapse of the FIU bridge, who saw that coming? Especially even the people that were there uh, on the highway and witnessed it and observed it and were killed by it. The ongoing political battles that are taking place in in our country and in our community today, and even our own personal struggles make hope a difficult, if not an impossible destination. And I speak with people week after week who are struggling, not with hope, People week after week who are struggling with hopelessness in their lives. And they sit back and want to know, what in the world is going on? Well, today we celebrate. Because if Easter, if Resurrection Sunday is about anything, Resurrection Sunday is all about hope. And my goal today in just a few moments is to connect the dots I want to connect the dots today between Jesus' resurrection, an event that, 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 that happened some 2,000 years ago, and with the hopeless and tragic events that are taking place around us. And you might even sit back today and say, Brian, you have no clue what's going on in my life. And you're right, I don't have any clue what's going on in your life. But there's a sovereign God, omniscient God in heaven who does. And there's a sovereign God that offers you hope today. Yes, even in the midst of hopelessness. And so, uh, the message of the resurrection, here's the point that I want you to catch today. The message of the resurrection gives the Christian, gives the follower of Jesus Christ hope no matter what is happening. And I can share with you today as a follower of Jesus Christ that the best for you is yet to come. And the best for me is yet to come. Not because who I am, not because what I have, not because who you are and what you have, but simply because the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive. The Apostle Peter talks about that in his short letter. Let me just read a few verses from 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll put them up on the screen. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Peter says this, 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. By the way, aren't you thankful for the mercy of God today? Where where would you be, where would I be without God's mercy? According to his great mercy, notice this phrase, he has caused us to be born again, notice, to a living hope. Let me read that again. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. I love this last phrase, kept in heaven for you, (laughs) waiting in heaven for you and for me. Would you pray with me today? Lord, thank you for the uh, beautiful time of worship that we had today. Thank you for Stephen and his team and the effort that they've put into preparing a, just a wonderful worship service. Thank you, Lord, for our volunteers that are scattered all over the parking lot, that are scattered all over the building, uh, many of them with uh, our boys and girls today. And thank you for so many people that are involved to make the service a success. Lord, I'm grateful for those that have come today those who attend HCC on a regular basis and those that maybe have come back and maybe those that are here for the very first time. I pray, as Stephen mentioned today, help them to realize that you love them. Help them to realize that you are chasing after them, that you desire to have a personal relationship with each and every one of us. So, Lord, help us today on this Resurrection Sunday to examine our relationship with Jesus. Thank you for what you're going to do in our hearts and our lives, and it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So, it's interesting. So, so Peter writes these words that we just read some 30 years after the death of Jesus. And Peter writes these words with a purpose. He, He is writing to encourage a generation that is losing hope. He is writing to encourage a a people scattered throughout Asia Minor who are experiencing hopelessness. As a matter of fact, these people were experiencing many of the things that, that you and I maybe experience on a regular basis. You said, Brian, What were they going through? As you read through this epistle, you find that they were being abused by overbearing bosses. You might sit back and say, boy, that's me for sure. They they were being threatened by unbelieving spouses. Peter talks about that. They were ridiculed by skeptical neighbors and associates. And they were being persecuted by a cruel government. In other words, the recipients of this letter were living in a very anti-Christian society. A society that didn't support followers of Christ, but actually a society that ridiculed and ostracized followers of Christ. And so Peter is writing to believers, offering them hope in the midst of hopelessness. Now you might say, okay, Brian, how does Peter do that? He does it in a very simple way. He reminds them of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he says, in the midst of everything that you were experiencing, the most important truth that you can understand, the most important truth that you can wrap your mind and your heart around is the truth that Jesus is alive. It changes everything. As we'll see in the passage today, it changes the way that we view life, and it changes the way that we view death. So, so if you have your, your outline in front of you, just two simple points today that I want you to see, because I want you us to walk away understanding how this event that took place 2,000 years ago impacts your life and mine in 2018. So two things that Peter says. Let me show you, first of all, what he says. The first thing he says is this, Jesus' resurrection gives life. Jesus' resurrection gives life. In verse 3, let me read it again. I'm not sure we can put it up on the screen, but it says, He, God, has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Now, 
The phrase born again that it is a phrase that has been frequently used in modern day religious culture. Some of you, I'm going to date myself and I might date you. Some of you might remember that that, was, that that phrase was first used in our culture back in the 1976 presidential election. Remember when Jimmy Carter publicly declared that he was born again. Many, many viewed that declaration, and many still view that declaration as, as just a Protestant spiritual experience. And quite frankly, in our culture, depending upon your religious background, that phrase either has a positive connotation or a negative connotation. You, you might hear that phrase and, uh, and automatically say, amen, that's me. Or you might hear that phrase and kind of be turned off by that phrase just a little bit today. I want you to catch this though. That phrase was not an invention of Jimmy Carter. He wasn't the first person that said it. You say, okay, Brian, who was the first person that said it? Jesus was. Jesus was the first person who used that phrase. Clear back in John chapter 3, Jesus was having a dialogue at night with this religious leader by the name of Nicodemus. Maybe you've heard the story. And in John chapter 3, in verse 3, Jesus looks at Nicodemus and he says this. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, notice Jesus is using the phrase, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I love Nicodemus' response. It's classic. It's how, it's how you and I would have responded because Nicodemus explains, what do you mean? Can I as an old man enter back into my mother's womb and be reborn? Nicodemus is telling Judas, or Jesus, that, that, that makes no sense whatsoever. But catch this today. Jesus is not talking about physical rebirth Jesus is talking about spiritual regeneration. That's what Jesus is talking about. Matter of fact, I wrote in your notes, the phrase to be born again means to regenerate or to make alive, to renew life, to infuse life, to to revive that which is dead. And so here in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Peter says that, that God has caused us to, using that same phrase, caused us to be born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here's what Peter is talking about. Peter is talking about God breathing new life, God breathing spiritual life into those who are spiritually dead. You might sit back and say, okay, Brian, who are those who are spiritually dead? Well, the Apostle Paul talks about that. He says, anybody who is not in Christ, anybody who does not have a personal relationship with Christ is dead. As a matter of fact, he starts Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, telling the Ephesians, you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. So any person who does not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul says, the Bible says that they are spiritually dead. So here's what God desires. God desires to take those dead spiritual bones and God desires to breathe new life into them. You say, Brian, how does that happen? He he said it in verse three. He has caused us to be born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Today, this morning, we are not just celebrating historical events. Today, we are celebrating the fact that God loved us enough that he desired to breathe new life into our spiritual deadness. And he sent Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and was buried and rose again, overcoming death, overcoming sin, overcoming the enemy and overcoming all the things that you and I struggle with. You see, the key word in the verse that we're looking at is the word through. And I want you to catch this today. You were not born again by attending church. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm so glad that you're here today. And if you don't have a church home, we would love for Hollywood Community Church to be your church home. But I want to be crystal clear today. You are not born again by attending church. 
You're not born again by working in our food pantry. We have scores of people who work in our food pantry and we feed, <coughs> excuse me, scores of families every single week and we love that ministry. But you can work in the food pantry week after week and month after month and year after year and not be born again. Working in the food pantry does not make you born again. Giving a large charitable, thank you so much. Is this new or did you drink out of it, Josh? It's new? Yeah. Thank you. You're not born again by making a large charitable donation. Here's what I want you to catch today. You were only spiritually made alive by the power of Jesus' resurrection. Let me say that again. You were only spiritually made alive by the power of Jesus' resurrection. Stephen and the team sang these words. I love these words just a few moments ago. By your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected king is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected king is resurrecting me. So my question for you today, and it's a very personal, intimate question, is not are you a member of Hollywood Community Church? That's not my question for you today. To be quite frankly today, I really don't care if you're a Baptist, if you're a Presbyterian, if you're a Methodist, if you're a Catholic, or if you say, Brian, I'm a non-denominationalist. That really doesn't interest me today. My only concern for you is this. Has the resurrected King, Jesus Christ, resurrected you? Has the resurrected king resurrected you? You say, Brian, how? How is that done? Later in this chapter, Peter alludes to it in verse 23 of this chapter. He uses that same phrase again. He says, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, not of something that can die or something that, that will fade away, but of imperishable, notice what he says, through the living and abiding Word of God. Remember, he talked about a, a lively hope that we had before. And so here he talks about the fact that, that, that God has written down for us his story, the story of Jesus, the story of the gospel. He has written that down for us. And that story is not a dead um, uh, story for us. It is a living, it is an abiding word for us. So here's what God does. God takes the truth of that that is found in his word, and he connects it with my heart and with your heart some 2,000 plus years later to the extent that the Holy Spirit of God then takes that. He takes that seed, that, that, that breath of spiritual, spirit air, and breathes it into our heart, and we believe by faith. We take the message and we believe, and at that moment, we are what? We are made alive. You see, the living Word of God takes an event that happened 2,000 years ago. It makes it relevant to your life and mine. Yes, even here in the year 2018. So, so my question for you today, and it's a question that only you can answer, the question is this, are you spiritually alive or are you spiritually dead? Are you spiritually alive today? Once again, I'm not asking you if you're going to come back next Sunday. I want you to. I'm not asking you, uh, you know, what your plans are. I'm asking you, have you been born again? Has the Holy Spirit of God taken the truth of the gospel and has it changed your life? Has it resurrected you and changed you to the degree that though you were dead in your sins, you now are alive in Jesus Christ? That's what the resurrection is all about. I mean, to say it in modern terms today, are you alive or are you a spiritual zombie? Are you walking around like the characters in the living dead and you seem to have life, but on the inside you're not alive? You're dead and you seem to be withering away. Well, I'm here to share with you today that the gospel, the story of the resurrection, Jesus' resurrection gives life. And he desires to give you life today. Jesus himself said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. 
And Jesus wants you to have a tremendous life right now. But more importantly, he realizes that our time here on earth is just short. And he desires for you to live with him for all of eternity. In his grace, in his mercy, he offers you and I something that we could never, ever, ever obtain ourselves. The resurrection of Jesus gives life. If you're here today and there's never been a moment in your life where you sit back, and maybe you've never even thought about this. Maybe life's been so complicated and so busy and you've gone through life and you've actually spent very little time thinking about your spiritual condition and thinking about your relationship with God. I'd like you to take just a moment and think about that today. How is your relationship with God? Maybe you're here today and you say, man, Brian, I'm, I'm really not sure. Well, the Bible tells us very clearly that if we will confess our sins, all of us are sinners, if we will confess our sins and we by faith will turn to him and basically come to God and say, okay, God, here's the deal. I can't do it on my own. I desperately need you in my life. It's that act of faith that God will take and he will respond to that and he will do a work of grace in your life just as he's done a work of grace in my life and in so many people's lives that are here today. There's a second thing that Jesus says in the passage, and I, I want you to catch it because it ties right in. The second thing is Jesus' resurrection not only gives us life, but Jesus' resurrection gives hope. It gives hope. Remember he said that he caused us to be born again to a living hope. Now, now I, I want you to understand that, that the hope that you and I normally possess is different than the hope of the Bible. For the majority of us, hope is a desire for something we are uncertain about getting or experiencing. For example, I can say, man, I hope my wife makes fried chicken for lunch today. I'm not sure that's going to happen, but I, say, I can say, man, I, I hope she makes fried chicken for lunch today. Or I can say, man, I hope the Dolphins draft a quarterback this year, right? And how many of you are hoping for the exact same thing, all right? How many of you are hoping they just draft somebody that sticks with us for a couple of years, huh? Right, you might sit back today and say, man, I hope Brian is almost done talking. How much time is he going to spend talking? And so we, we have this hope for us as a desire. It's desiring something that we're not sure whether it's really going to happen or not. But when the Bible mentions the word hope, that's not what it means. Hope in the Bible is not an uncertain anticipation. Hope in the Bible is a confident expectation. It's not something that we hope is going to happen, that we cross our fingers and we cross our toes and we cross everything, just hoping that it's going to take place. Someone has said this, the biblical hope is not a hope so, rather it is a no so. That's why Peter describes it as a lively hope. So, so, so I want to I wanna repeat right now my, my premise today because it's so very important. The veracity, the reality, the authenticity of Jesus' resurrection gives the Christian a confident expectation that the best is yet to come. And it doesn't matter what trials we are going through. It doesn't matter what's happening in our world. Quite frankly, it doesn't matter what's happening in our government. It doesn't matter what's happening. I'm not saying don't be involved. Hey, we're all involved. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that the truth of the gospel transcends all of that. And that the resurrection of Jesus Christ offers us hope even in the bleakest moments. And Peter tells us that here in the passage. He says two things. Let me give it to you quickly. He says, resurrection hope gives you a new outlook on death. Resurrection hope gives you and I a new outlook on death. I love the way Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, because Paul is talking about the second coming of Christ, and he's talking about believers that are dying. And Paul says this. Notice his words. We'll put it up on the screen. We don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, those who have already died. That's what he's talking about. Those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others, what does he say? Who have no hope. What is Paul saying? 
Paul is saying that there's a marked difference between the way believers grieve and the way unbelievers grieve. There's a marked difference between the way followers of Jesus Christ grieve and those who aren't followers of Jesus Christ grieve. Why is that? Because as followers of Christ, we have hope. Vicki sang just a few moments ago, Son of God and Son of Man, conquering death, you rose again, taking all our fear and dread, giving peace and hope instead. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. You see, resurrection hope gives us a different outlook on death. As a matter of fact, in verse 4, we, we just mentioned it. Peter, Peter says that we look forward, as believers, we look forward to that which awaits us. He says that we look forward to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven, guarded, reserved in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded. Here's what that means. Here's what that means. Catch this. Everything that God has planned for you is safe in heaven. It's under lock and key. It's guarded by 24-hour security. As a matter of fact, I'd tell you today that all of your heavenly information, everything God has for you is much more secure than your data on Facebook or your data on any other social media. God has it all planned God has it all worked out. And God says, here's what I got. I got it on deposit, this, uh, this inheritance that it's yours. It's, it's undefiled. It's unfading. Man, it's not going to wear away. Nobody can steal it. It is secure. It is waiting for you. That's why as believers, man, we, we have this hope. We, we face death and no one wants to die, but we face death differently. Why is that? Because we know what awaits us. And we don't have a certain and an uncertain anticipation. We have a confident expectation of what awaits us. Man, I've sat by the deathbed of many people who are unbelievers, and I've seen them struggle with the uncertainty of what is awaiting them on the other side. And likewise, I've sat on the deathbed of many followers of Jesus Christ, and I've been able to experience the confident joy that they experience at that moment. Why is that? Because they have hope. They know what is awaiting them. Let me ask you today, what is your outlook on death? Someone has said this, that you're not ready to live until you're ready to die. And when you're ready to die, you're finally ready to live. Peter mentions one other thing, and I'm done. He said, resurrection hope gives you a new outlook, not only on death, but it gives you a new outlook on life. Now, now here's what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean that, okay, if I become a follower of Christ, my life is going to be problem-free. No more problems, no more struggles. The, the, that's not what it means. I would remind you, if you know or not, that the recipient, that this letter was written sometime around 64 AD, about, about 30 years or so after the death of Christ. If you know much about history, it was right about that time that the Neronian persecution began to take place. Sometime between 64 AD, 67 AD, uh, historians are uncertain exactly as the date. You said, Brian, okay, f fill me in. What does that mean? Roman Colosseums. Christians eaten by lions. Christians burned at the stake. As I said that the re as I mentioned that the recipients of this letter were going through struggles, they were going through real life struggles. Being a follower of Jesus Christ was not easy. As a matter of fact, many of them would give their lives for it. So how does Peter address that? In verse 7 of this chapter, Peter says, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may result in the praise and glory and honor and revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter doesn't look at them and say, listen, God's going to make it all go away. 
Because God doesn't always make it all go away. Suffering is a part of life. I wish I could look at you today and say, man, if you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you become a member of Hollywood Community Church, your bank account's just going to take off. And you're never, ever going to be sick again. And that old death thing, man, you can kiss that goodbye. Just become a follower of Jesus. Man, I wish I could tell you that, but I can't. I can't tell you that you're not going to suffer. I'm not, I, I can't tell you that your doctor is not going to give you bad news tomorrow. I can't tell you that your boss is not going to stop abusing you. I can't tell you that your neighbors aren't going to ridicule you. I can't tell you that you're not going to have relationship problems. I can't tell you that you're not going to get frustrated by everything that's happening in our world. But I can tell you this, all of that is temporary. All of that is temporary. And that's what Peter is saying. He says, we have a hope that will endure, that will live, that will outlive all of those things. All of that is temporary. And our best is yet to come. Why is that? Because Jesus rose from the dead. And the resurrected king desires to resurrect you. And God desires to not only save you in this life, but he desires to save you in the life to come. I love the way the Message Bible translates verse 3. It says this, we've been given a brand new life and we have everything to live for. Today, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you've been given a brand new life and you have everything to live for. Why is that? Because you have hope. 1927, submarine went down, an S-4 submarine went down off the coast of Massachusetts. You can read about it online. Actually, a Coast Guard cutter didn't see it. And at the last minute, a Coast Guard cutter hit one of our submarines and the submarine sank. I think there were eight souls on board. Three or four of them, or or, or two of three of them died instantly. The the sub sank all the way down to 100 feet of water. You would sit back and say, boy, that's not that difficult. Well, remember it was more than 100, or or was close to 100 years ago, 90 years ago. They didn't have the technology that we have today. At that moment, a nor'easter came in, and, and turbulent waves, turbulent waves seemed to be tossing the rescue ships that wanted to get there to save those six souls that remained. But the rescuers were unable to reach them because of the tempest. They, they tried to put a diver down. The diver put his, his ear or something up to the, to the side of the submarine, and they were able with Morse code to begin to communicate with them. And after a day, the, the waters were so treacherous, they weren't able to do that. And so they used an oscillator. It's an interesting story, an oscillator that attached to the hull. And as a result, the, the rescuers could communicate with the six souls that were left in board, on board. It's interesting to read the communication that was going back and forth. Obviously, the six guys on board wanted to know, are you coming? (laughs) How long is it going to be? Can you communicate with our family members? One day passed, two days passed. They were running out of oxygen. They were communicating with them, how much oxygen do you have left? We have 24 hours left. We have 12 hours left. The men started sending messages back to their family members. The next to last message was just a a slow message. Three words. Is there hope? Is there hope? Sadly, they couldn't reach them. The last message of the guys were, we understand. And by the time the rescuers reached them, all six of the men had perished there at the bottom of the ocean in that supper submarine. But in the last moments of their life, here's what they wanted to know. Is there any hope? Is there any hope? Maybe you're here today, and you're struggling with things that are happening in your life. You're struggling with things that are happening in our world. You're struggling with things that are happening in our town. And you sit back and you question, Is there any hope? Brian, it seems like the world's going to hell in a handbasket. I get it. Is there any hope? And today, the story of Easter is all about the fact, yes, there is hope. Death has been defeated. 
Sin has been defeated. The enemy has been defeated. And the story of Easter, complicated as it may be, is very simple. It's the God of heaven offering hope to you and me. And by resurrecting from the dead, Jesus gives us life and he gives us hope. Do you have that today? Do you have that? Man, I wish I could communicate, and my language is so limited. I wish I could communicate to you the desire of the God of heaven who desires to have a personal relationship with you. Why else would he send Jesus to the earth? Why else would Jesus go through everything that he's gone through that we've, that we've talked about the last few days? Why else would he do that? It's what the group sang about just a few moments ago. It's the reckless love of God. God sh- searching for you, seeking for you, doing everything everything he possibly can because he loves you and he desires to have a personal relationship with you and he wants to rescue you. He doesn't want to leave you at the bottom of the ocean. He doesn't want to leave you in a closed submarine. He wants to rescue you. And he's done everything he possibly can for you. What is your response to him? Today he offers you life. Today he offers you hope. Would you receive that gift of life? Stephen and our team are going to come and they're going to lead us in in two great songs of worship as we conclude our service today. But I want you to know, I want you to know we're going to have have prayer counselors right down front. Our elders and our deacons are going to be down front. Man, first of all, if you're here today and you do not know that you have life, you say, Brian, and I'm not certain about death and I'm certainly not certain about life. Brian, I need Jesus in my life. We have counselors down front that would love to take just a moment and pray with you. But even in the quietness of your seat, You can reach out to Jesus and in your heart and in your own words, confess your sins and reach out to Jesus as your Savior and allow him to transform you from death to life and allow him to move you from hopelessness to hope. In Jesus, we have hope. Would you repeat that with me today? We have hope hope. One more time. We have hope. Thank you, God. Thank you that you love us, not because we deserve it. There's not a single one of us here today that deserves this. You love us not because of who we are. You love us in spite of who we are. You loved us so much that you sent Jesus to be the scapegoat. You sent Jesus to be the sacrifice. You sent Jesus to take our place, bearing all of our sins on his body, paying the price for our sins. Put him in a grave, and three days later, he overcame sin, he overcame death, he overcame the enemy, he overcame death, and he rolled that stone, and he walked out triumphantly out of that grave. And today we have life, we have hope, because Jesus is alive. I pray if there's somebody here that doesn't have that assurance in their life that this morning before they leave this building, that they would open up their heart and they would trust Jesus Christ. I pray for those that are living hopelessly today. Maybe they don't even share it with anybody else. I pray that today that they would reach out and grab the only true hope that's available for us. They would reach out and grab Jesus today. Lord, lift our hopes today through the message of the gospel. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.